1771, a five-story building was built in Cromford, Derbyshire. Curious passers-by marvelled at its scale, the constant clatter of machinery, and if they were passing at 6am or 6pm, the 200 men, women and children filing in and out for their shift. This was Richard Arkwright's mill, the world's first successful water-powered cotton spinning mill and one of the world's first modern factories. What would have appeared alien in the 1770s became increasingly commonplace in many towns and cities just a few decades later, transforming British cities, the economy, society, and eventually even British politics. This was what Arnold Toynbee later dubbed the Industrial Revolution. Small workshop and domestic manufacturing, undertaken with simple hand tools and human-powered machines, was gradually overtaken by factory production, in which water and steam powered larger and more complex machines. The textile industry was one of the first to embrace steam power on a large scale, with Manchester, later dubbed Cottonopolis, becoming the world's first industrial city. What made all this possible? Steam engines, a vital component of industrialization, need an efficient and controllable source of heat, which coal provided. Thanks to improvements in mining technology and a natural abundance of coal in Britain, this could be extracted in greater quantities than ever before. This freed the economy from its earlier energy constraints, previously limited to what could be harnessed by burning wood or powered by man or horse. The Wheel Virgin steam engine could do the work of 953 horses. It's not enough though to simply dig up coal. You then need the infrastructure to get it where it needs to go. Moving it around by sea or rivers was not always efficient and was at the mercy of tides and the weather. This led to investment, initially by mine owners, in canals. In 1761, the Duke of Bridgewater opened a canal between his coilery at Worsley and Manchester, which, within weeks of its opening, halved the price of coal. By 1851, there were over 2,000 miles of canal in use. At the same time, new turnpike roads were being constructed, paid for by tolls on passing traffic, this helped dramatically reduce inland journey times. By the 1830s, it was possible to get from London to Edinburgh in just two days by stagecoach. Fifty years earlier, the same journey took two and a half weeks. Coal also spurred the development of the railways. In 1758, the first act of Parliament to authorise the construction of a railway was to enable Charles Brandling to move coal from his coilery in Middleton to Leeds, three miles away. The use of these high-powered machines led to the creation of modern factories, where one or two engines might power multiple machines over various floors, as was the case in Arkwright's mill. For reasons of convenience, considering the necessary infrastructure, transport, worker housing and related commercial services, factories increasingly tended to be located in cities, which in turn accelerated urbanisation. A similar concentration occurred with labour. In the cotton industry, labourers gradually shifted from working in the home to taking up better paid jobs in the mills. For some, this meant gaining new skills in managing and working the machines. For many others, this resulted in being de-skilled and relegated to repetitive drudgery. This large, often precariously employed workforce developed a class consciousness, albeit fragmented, and began to organise on an unprecedented scale. Workers called for improvements to living conditions, employment rights, their children's education, and the vote to ensure Parliament listened to these demands. The Industrial Revolution also led to the creation of a new, prosperous class of industrialists who could amass huge fortunes, enabling them or their descendants to join the old elite. Sir Robert Peel, for example, was the son of a cotton textile manufacturer. These were the men who successfully secured the vote with the Great Reform Act of 1832. Working-class men would have decades more to wait. Despite the extraordinary changes occurring, we should not overstate the scale of industrialization before 1850. The largest occupational category in 1851 remained agriculture, followed by domestic service. As Professor David Canadine writes, the number of men working as blacksmiths was greater than the number employed in ironworks, and more men worked with horses on the roads than with steam engines on the railways. 
Even in the new industrial sectors, the average cotton mill employed fewer than 20 people, and steam power had only been applied to a limited number of industries. It was then appropriate that Britain at mid-century should be known as the workshop of the world, rather than the factory of the world.